to commit certain sins of which you will not repent. He's never going to leave you alone. He'll never leave me alone. That's not his business. He goeth about as a roaring lion seeking a diligent search of patient inquiry, seeking whom he may devour. That's all he does. So I would like to speak to you this afternoon <clears throat> about compromising with the devil. You'll notice that we begin with Exodus chapter 8, verses 25 through 28. So we're talking about the time when Moses was seeking to get the children of Israel to be freed from Egyptian bondage. And when he was getting ready, that is Moses, to lead the Israel out of that bondage into the land of promise, the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, then the devil, through Pharaoh, tried to make some compromises with him. And you'll see all of that, Exodus chapters 8 through 10. Well, knowing that the Old Testament is just not history, then there's lessons to be learned there that can help us in resisting the devil, which we're required to do. Resist the devil, we're taught, and he will flee from you. Paul said we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, just how he operates. So we need to understand some things from this that will help us be faithful today. Or, if you're not a child of God, to know whether the devil's trying to get you in your own mind to compromise with what the Bible plainly teaches one must do to become a Christian, to be saved from sin. So we can learn a great deal by studying these compromises that the devil offered to Moses because he's still offering those compromises today. First of all, the compromise of remaining in the world. We note the text being verse 25 of Exodus 8. Notice that he was willing to let the people go worship, but only if they would do it in the land. Moses has said, let's go three-day journey out of the land. Uh, but he said, well, I'll let you go, uh, but you worship, or I'll let you worship, but you'll worship in the land. Don't leave Egypt. Well, in our day, the devil has no objection to people worshiping, no objection to people having Bibles, and no objection to various things. Just as long as we do not do it in the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, the one he purchased with his blood, Acts 20, verse 28, the one to which he adds all of those who are baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38 and 47. They will come up with every idea in the world, and I say they, I mean people, who believe in God, Christ, and the Bible, believe in sin, and it needs to be forgiven. But usually they say, oh, the church is no significance. What about the church? Well, it just had anything to do with our salvation. How a person can read the New Testament and come up with that idea, I don't know. But uh, that's just simply the devil trying to get people to compromise, and they've been willing to do it. So he tries to delude people to think that it doesn't really make any difference. And how many times have we heard that over the years? God cannot be worshipped acceptably in a man-made denomination. This is what people don't understand. For 500 years, people have seen Christianity as denominationalism. They have no concept of it strictly as it's taught on the pages of the New Testament. Denominationalism rising in Europe, as was known in those days, Protestant denominationalism, Protestant because they protested the great corruption that was in the Roman Catholic Church, originated... 1,500 years after the Lord started His church, which you can read about in Acts 2. And it's there why we can't realize that's what He did and that's when He did it is beyond me when you take the totality of the Bible dealing with the church and the significance of it and when it started. One of the marks of the Lord's church is that it did not start before the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. It did not start afterwards. It started on that day as is recorded by the inspired Luke in your own Bible in Acts chapter 2. So there are no faithful children of God in man-made churches or in world religions. It doesn't make any difference how sincere they are. I well remember being in Singapore one time and several of us preachers got in a cab to go back to the motel and the fellow that was driving was rather talkative and 
he asked about what we were doing and so forth, and we told him, and I guess he thought he'd try to appeal to us in the way you would most denominational folks. He said, well, uh, you know, it really doesn't make a difference um, what or who you believe, just as long as you're sincere in believing it. I said, well, what about this? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, he had already admitted he was a Buddhist who really doesn't believe in any kind of God. Well, he ceased to be talkative. He got rather silent. There it is, plain as you can see. God does not just accept things because you're all caught up in it and you mean well in it and you're sincere about it and you're dedicated to it. And so it is when it comes to becoming a Christian where God locates Christians and so on regarding the church. It's a lie to think that it does not make a difference how we worship God. And that worship is only acceptable to God by faithful children of God and they're only found in the church that Jesus built, Acts 2, 41, 42, and 47. Those verses teach now what they taught when they were first written and they mean now what they meant when they were first written and it'll be the same way on the day of judgment. Worship according to the commandments of men, Jesus said, was vain, which means pointless or worthless. Worship, Matthew 15, 8, and 9. Now the Jews were God's chosen people for the reason He chose them. Through them would come the Messiah. He would do what He had to do to save man. So they were God's covenant people. Yet what is said in Matthew 15, 8, and 9 by Jesus was said to them. Was said to them. I've been in vain you do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus Christ is either the Son of the living God, the only begotten Son of God, the Savior of the world, or He is not. You can't say, well, I'll just take Him or leave Him. It really doesn't make any difference about Him. And so it is with every religion on this earth. I want you to notice how Moses met this compromise. Notice he said they would sacrifice as the Lord would command them, Exodus 8, 26 and 27. As Moses did, we'd better take heed lest we sacrifice the abomination of the sectarians, the denominationalists, to the Lord our God. Or any other religion that is not coming from God's good word, the Bible. Moses is not going to offer just any sacrifice to the Lord, Acts, or rather Exodus 8 and verse 27. He would not offer to God in worship that which was not authorized by God. And we must be guided by the commands of the Lord, not what our parents thought, our brothers and sister in the flesh taught, our children, our spouse. That's not the way God's going to judge any of us. And for those of us in the church, whatever comes floating down the pike by some preacher that speaks well, looks good, educated well officially and academically, that doesn't make any difference. If it's not according to the rightly divided word of truth, then it's not right. It's wrong. It's not acceptable to God. We must be guided by those commands because He is the one to be worshipped, to be served, and we must please Him in our service and in our worship. That's made very clear throughout the Bible. If you remember last week, we talked about uh, doing all things according to the pattern showed to Moses in the Mount. And that was written to Christians to say you have to have the same disposition of heart toward the New Testament of Jesus Christ. That pattern is the authoritative will of God. We must operate accordingly. Hebrews 8 and verse 5. Then there is the compromise of lukewarmness. I think this is one of the greatest compromises members of the Lord's church have made. You see Moses dealing with that in Exodus 8 and verse 28. When Pharaoh saw that Moses was determined to go, he then said this, Only ye shall not go very far away. Exodus 8 and verse 28. Only ye shall not go very far away. That may, though said in different ways, sound a bit familiar with the way people operate today. When we understand the New Testament teaching on what it takes to become a Christian, what true conversion from the ways of the world to Jesus Christ to be a Christian, in believing in Christ and how that belief is formed and repentance and what it really is and confession of faith in Christ, 
then when we're baptized into Christ, the devil doesn't want us to go very far. He may let us go that far. But just don't get too radical in the church. Don't get too determined to be everything the New Testament says you ought to be. You know, keep some things back for yourself. After all, God's loving. He's magnanimous. He favors you. You're in the realm of where He displays His favor. Uh, but, you know, God just does not accept that kind of service or worship when it's with reservations. We have no right to reserve anything to ourselves in view of God having given all that could be given and the greatest of the greatest to be given of which there's no greater and that's Jesus Christ. So, we can't keep to speak in this way one foot in the world and one foot in the church. If we must be in the church, the devil wants us then to be worldly. It's like Pharaoh said, you just don't go too far. He wants us to believe there's no harm in missing the assemblies of worship, Bible study periods. You see, I reserve that to myself to decide whether those things are important or not, or if anything's more important that can come before those things. And you can take that and go through any aspect of the Christian life and say, will I let God have his way with me? That's the reason that song was written. Let him have his way with thee. Have you ever noticed in fact how much in the Bible says you must bend the knee to Christ? You must let him have his way with you and that's by being obedient to him. He wants us to believe, that is Satan, that there's no harm in, uh, we'll put it in quotes because there really is no such thing, innocent, immodest dress. But there is. It's contrary to the Lord's will. The Bible has much to say about how we present ourselves to one another and the way we wear our clothes and so on. Or not wear them as the case may be. He wants us to believe there's no harm in uh, uh, beverage alcohol. That is, drinking it like you would a Pepsi or Dr. Pepper or whatever, or grape juice. He wants us to believe there's no harm in wagering, gambling, uh, well, not studying your Bible too much or maybe not praying or being concerned about your own brethren as to whether they're faithful or not or where they are when they've been gone for two months from the services or how they're living in the world. Too much of what we think of as Christianity is really just having to do with assembling. This does not put down the importance of the worship assemblies and Bible study hours. Not at all. But it says... This goes far beyond, that is living the Christian life and all that the New Testament defines that to mean, goes far beyond these worship assemblies. It goes to every day of our lives. It goes into our families as to what a husband, wife, father, mother, and where you are in your employment and how you live before your neighbors. All of that has to do, don't go too far. Our Lord has many of His enemies in the church, His own spiritual body, and that's a shame. When you consider the first sin in the early church, that of Ananias and Sapphira, if you didn't have, at least to that point of that record, if you didn't have inspiration letting us learn the truth about them, you might think they were some of the finest members of the Lord's church there could be. But God who sees the heart knows better. And thus there they were, seeking prestige and willing to lie to God about what they were giving when they, as Peter said, it was in your power you do with what you want. Why do you have to do this? Well, it shows you how far things will go and they were willing to compromise in certain areas. Of course, in a sermon like this, you can't talk about all the areas of the Christian life in which you could compromise, but the devil knows every one of them. He knows the weakest link in our armor. These people are friends of the world. And to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. James 4, 4 and James 1, 27, and Titus 2, 11 and 12. And that's what we can't not be. And why would anybody who names the name of Christ to be his Savior would want to be a friend of the ways of the world? Christians must, it's imperative, it's obligatory, keep themselves out of worldly compromising positions. We've even forgotten this, it seems to me, 
that when Paul said all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. Even when you find out that something's authorized, it may not be the best thing for you to do. It may not be encouraging you to be closer to the truth. It may not be encouraging somebody else. So when you know it's authorized, that's well and good. But is it the best thing to do at the time under the circumstances? We don't think much beyond that because we're still trying to get people to understand you must do only as it's authorized and how the Bible authorizes and how we ascertain it. But also, he wants people in their families to compromise. The compromise of undedicated families. Now you have to go over to Exodus chapter 10 verses 8 through 11 on this. But the devil is offering this to Moses when he said, well, okay, go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord. Well, what did he say? Well, you who are the males, uh, you go, but you leave behind others. You leave them behind. I've heard men actually say, well, all that religion is good for the women or something like that, but it's not for me. Trying to say this is important for one person in the family, but not important to somebody else. The late Brother George Darling, who was a fine gospel preacher as far as I know, been dead many years now, I suppose over 40 years. His articles still show up some. But he was not a member of the Lord's Church when he married his wife, and she was very devout as far as her faithfulness. And he wasn't anything, didn't pretend to be. And he reported that he did all he could to try to Stop her from going to church. Assembling with the saints, being active in the church. And he actually got up one morning uh, before they did and messed up the distributor cap so the car wouldn't start. And it was a cold, snowy morning. And when she got up, he just watched her. And the car wouldn't start. So she came back in, never said a word. Got their children, I think they had at least two. And just started walking to church. So that was the beginning of shaming me into paying attention to why somebody was dedicated to something like that. Another time we were preaching in Van Buren, Arkansas. There was a couple at that point. It was about uh, my parents' age. In fact, they were older, I think. And there was a little lady who was still attending there. And they told me this, that one morning it was snowy and cold. And they just decided it was too bad to get out and go. So they were laying up in the bed, and they happened to look out the window, and this little widow lived across the road. And there she was coming down the steps off the side of the hill, going to walk to church. When they were laying up there with a car and could have taken them, said that was a joke to them. Made them see themselves for what they really were when preaching wasn't doing it for them. Strange how the devil works, isn't it? The devil doesn't want us to bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. Now, you know that's enjoined upon us. That's our responsibility as husbands, head of the house, and as fathers, to bring the children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if you've got a faithful home, then father and mother are active in doing whatever is necessary to do that. Well, you can be sure if, if God has authorized that, that it's expected of us, guess who's opposed to it? Well, it's going to be Satan. He does not want us to rear our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And he's going to try to get you to compromise. He wants us to leave the little ones alone. We hear stuff like, well, they're too young to go this or that or the other. You even see it in the churches. Well, they're too young to sit in the assembly of the saints. Let's make another assembly especially for them. Now, you have no authority to separate the assembly like that. But after all, they cause a racket and it's easier to handle them somewhere else. They forget about the adults that have to leave that assembly to go out there and tend to the children. So one error leads to all sorts of other error. Somebody will say, well, it's Wednesday night and the kids have got a lot of work to do at school. There's just too much homework. They've got a big test tomorrow. So they don't have to go to Bible study. And that just simply says, well, studying the Word of God, that's not very important. Or they have a ball game or, and you can't let the team down. I know one preacher, and John knows of this preacher too, he's dead now, who actually taught that if your child's on the ball team and you got the child uh, having to have a game on Wednesday night, then don't expect them to let the team down. 
Just pick out some gospel meeting later and let him make it up by going to that, but let him miss that Wednesday night. Now, this person, this man, a lot of Bible knowledge, I know. A lot of good stuff he taught, I know. I've got a whole lot of his material myself. But he was just as wrong as he could be when he taught that. How are you going to teach your kids to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And all these things should be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. When you let things like that, that are of this present world, come between you, and in that case, the assembly of the saints, the elders have called together to study God's good work. If the devil can get us to compromise in these things and many others, he has us, folks. We're in his grip. The devil does not want us to teach the word of God to our children. If dad and mom must study the Bible, that's okay. But don't be too concerned about the kids. After all, there's a whole lot of Bible hard for them to understand. I'll just jot down a couple of things here that are you jot them down. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Now I want you to realize, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. We're talking about that part of the Bible that we consider to be less important or very difficult to read. And yet, if you go back to that, you find that that was their Bible. When David extols the law and God's word and the commandments of God and all such things, the statutes of the Lord, what is he talking about? That part of the Bible we find too dry and too hard to read. What was the Bible that David had? What was God's word for him? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was basically what he had. He may have had down through possibly 1 Samuel, as we have it in our Bible, maybe 2 Samuel. But everything from there back to Genesis was what you read of in Psalms that he extolled. And yet that's the kind of stuff we think is just too hard. You might want to write down with Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9, Judges 2, 7 through 10. Judges chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. And you see what was said there about teaching the young people, teaching the children. And what was it that they were to teach? Those very things of the Old Testament we find difficult. The church needs members who, like Moses, will go with our young and with our old, with our sons, and with our daughters, with our flocks and herds, etc., Exodus 10, 9. In fact, I like the statement that Moses made. Not a hoof shall be left behind. Now, that's not compromising. That's saying everything God told us to do and the way he said it for the reason he said it and whoever's involved, that's the way it's going to be. And we're not going to listen to anything else. We're not going to have it any other way. Now, if that's written a four time for our learning, what do we learn about it that helps us under the authority of Christ in the New Testament? And then what kind of patterns are we setting before our children when it comes to the way we deal with those things? The children of today are so important for what they are today. But they're going to be, many of them, the church of tomorrow. I've lived long enough to go back over the years with churches, all the way back to my youth, all the way up to this present time. And I don't know how many people that, when, that was young when I was young, they haven't darkened the door over church, and I don't know when. Yet when I knew them, they were there all the time, involved in everything as far as children were concerned. And I do not know of the churches where we've been, that not just the young children or teenagers at the time we were there or maybe in their college years that were active and then years later go by and we find out not even attending or their homes all broken up all sorts of things we must understand that to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord means to bring them up in the system of faith that is the New Testament to learn the importance of obedience to God and this was what was brought out in the Old Testament in several places Joshua 24:14. And 15. Then it's taught again in the New Testament as Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. We should teach them then by precept and example, 1 Timothy 4, 12 and 2 Timothy 1, 13. That's exactly what Timothy's mother and grandmother did. <clears throat> you ever notice there, ladies, that the husband's not even mentioned because Timothy's father was a Greek, but his grandmother and mother were Jews and evidently devout. And Paul said of him, Thou hast known from a babe the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in salvation. 
And that's the way it works with everybody, regardless of when you are exposed to the Bible. If you have a receptive heart, if you have a receptive heart, then there's the compromise of undedicated livelihoods. Exodus 10, verse 24. The compromise of undedicated livelihoods. Notice this last one. Pharaoh says, well, you go, serve the Lord. Now listen, only let your flocks and your herds stay here. Again, the compromise. You get the idea Pharaoh says, I'm going to keep every cable I can attach to them and this country connected to them. It's going to pull them right back. Now, Jeff mentioned this morning the things about Job concerning, and I was thinking about this, Jeff. When it comes to the matter of stuff, you ever noticed how often? Buddy did years ago. He did a lesson on stuff. Stuff. My stuff. Your stuff. The garage is full of stuff. The closet's full of stuff. You need to clean your stuff up. You need to put your stuff up. That's what wives say to husbands a lot. We were too afraid to say that if they've done anything. <laughs> but anyway, stuff just dominates our life. Our stuff. That includes a lot of stuff. So if the devil can just get us to leave our stuff, then he has us. That is, if he can get us to stay with it, the affairs of this present world. After all, the doctrine of the health and wealth gospel is if you serve God, he's going to give you more stuff. And that was the point Jeff was making, at least one of the points that he made this morning regarding Job. We can be involved in the worship assembly, and we ought to be with the right attitude when the rest of our life is in harmony with the will of Jesus. And that would include Bible study and all that that means. But if we don't use our possessions, our time, our talents to advance the kingdom of God and defend the faith, can you really say we're converted in the true meaning of the word convert? You can pile up money, however little or a lot it is, put it somewhere in land or the bank or stocks and bonds or whatever. But don't put it to the work of the Lord in the salvation of souls, the edification of the saints. And really, what good is it to anybody? If the devil can get us to think this way, we're in his grip. We haven't really... Followed him on the basis of Matthew 6.33 of learning to put first things first. And look how we've trained our children. America has, because of its freedoms, become a plague to us. Because of its economic blessings, they've become a, a plague to us. We're always seeking after that which pertains to this life. And we use it for that purpose. If you read the book of James, he'll talk about prayer. And he'll say, your prayers aren't answered. Because you're basically praying for stuff. That's basically what he says. That's the reason your prayers aren't answered. You're praying for stuff. That you can satisfy your lusts. You're praying for a big nice house, car, this, whatever else. You're not thinking as Matthew 6.33 says you ought to think. As a converted person. As somebody that's a pilgrim just temporarily living here and passing through. Notice how he met this compromise. That is Moses. He just didn't compromise anything. Exodus 10, 26. And there's the spirit that we all need because that's the kind of attitude, disposition of the mind or be attitude that man has who's going to go to heaven. Nobody else is going to heaven that doesn't have it. We must lay everything we have at the feet of the master. We cannot serve God with reservations. We need to say to the world, those who are indicating, well, I'd like to be a Christian. Here's what it's going to cost you. There was one time a father and son walking down one side of the street in a small town, and the little boy saw a man he had known all his life as far as his morals and spiritual conduct was great. The little boy said, I give anything in the world. I give all in the world to be like him. His daddy said, that's exactly what it cost him. And that's right. We haven't learned this fundamental first principle matter yet. Nothing matters but doing the will of God. So he made no compromises with Pharaoh, Exodus 10, 26. All that we are 
and all that we have is to be given as a sacrifice unto the Lord. That's what's mentioned in Romans 12, 1 and 2. That our bodies are rendered living sacrifices unto God, which is our reasonable service. Now, I know it takes money to buy food. I kind of like to eat. I know what it takes to wear clothing and shelter is necessary. But we need to realize that God commands us to purpose in our hearts what we're going to give in the collection as an act of worship on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. And we don't think about that. Uh, I don't know where we think all this money is going to when we die. Uh, you know, you give it to your kids. You think they're going to spend it like you want them to spend it. Do you think anybody else is? If you read the book of Ecclesiastes and you read about how worldly people think who live solely for this present world, then you say vanity, vanity, all is vanity, said the preacher. Not from the perspective of the faithful child of God, but from the person who lives for this world. Because you live your life, you get stuff, or try to get stuff, and you try to multiply that stuff into other stuff, and you get to about my stage of life, or older, and you realize, well, what is all that accomplished? What, what does it matter? Have you ever just sat down in your chair and said, now if I had millions and millions of dollars in a 40 room house and 20 bathrooms in it or whatever else and 40 cars and all that kind of stuff. Okay, that may look good at 20, 25, and 30. But if you're sitting there 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, what's the difference in you and the fellow that just has a humble abode and done the best he could all his life to earn a living and live for the Lord and in that person? As far as what they have of this world. You know, how much did so-and-so leave when he died? He left all of it. How many times we talked and said that and smiled? That's exactly right. Paul says, we didn't bring anything into this world, and certainly we won't take anything out. So all these things are so fundamental and things you've heard, but we need to be reminded of them. The only money we really are saving is what we're putting into the work of the Lord, Matthew 6, 19 and 20. That's it. The only work that mounts to anything is our work to comply with God's will as to why we're here. But I don't think we see it that way. You know, the, way, the, the thing that I found out about brethren over the years is when they talk about their contributing, they don't talk about saying, I'm giving this to the Lord. I'm giving it to the church. Now, it may be just ignorance on their part of what the church is. But I've always thought I was giving whatever money it was, my time, whatever talent I have, whatever. I always thought it was rendered to the Lord, that it was a sacrifice due Him. It would change our minds if we'd realize, well, the Lord accept this from me, knowing my every fiber of being, knowing what I have. Would He accept that sacrifice? J.D., old brother J.D. Tant, he died in 1939, Pretty gruff fellow, but he said it like it ought to be said. He was preaching in Texas. He said that a very wealthy cattleman in the congregation. And when the collection plate was passed, he dropped in 50 cents. And Brother Tant saw him drop in the 50 cents. Knowing, as everybody else did, the kind of wealth the man had. So Brother Tant picked his 50 cents up and took it back to him and said, That's all you can give. We don't need that. Well, that's terrible. Must be a very unloving person. But think about it, brethren. How much did the Lord give for you? What did He give for me? You can't match it. You heard this matching giving? You give so much to the company, you'll give this. If we can get $1,000 from you, then we'll get whatever from somebody else. How are you going to match what God Himself gave? How can you do it? And you can't. You can just give all that you are and have according to the teaching of the Bible. That's the only way it works. So really when all is said and done, it's what we send on ahead, isn't it? Laying up treasures in heaven. Because there's the permanent abode, there's the eternal abode. 
We need to be so very careful that we do not make any compromises with the devil because he will definitely ensnare us and destroy our souls. As I said in the beginning, so I end with 1 Peter 5 and 8. That's what he wants to do. It's also on his mind. If we could have our mind on the work of the church and our individual Christian living, like the devil's mind is on you and me to get us to sin and keep us there, there is no end to the good we could do and the faith in God that we would have and the Bible knowledge we would exercise. What a wonderful thing that would be. Well, I hope these things have helped us to understand how things from the Old Testament can help us live the Christian life, strengthen us and bless us to make right choices that heaven will be our home. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to seriously consider these matters. They're said out of love for you. They're said because we want you to be saved even we want ourselves saved. And the only way we can save ourselves is to live right, and that involves teaching the truth to others who don't know it because it's the truth that saved us. Nothing else could save me or anybody else but the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody loved me enough to teach me the truth. Think of how much we owe other people who prepared themselves and did that. So we want you to believe in Christ based upon His Word. Romans 10, 17. Repent of your sins and obedience to His will and Going through the plan of salvation, Acts 17.30. Confess your faith in Him, Romans 10.10. And complete your obedience to the gospel, being immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. There is no other way. Don't let somebody cause you to compromise. Because that's just the devil working through that somebody, even as the devil worked through Pharaoh and attempted to get Moses to compromise about the children of Israel being let go. Say in your mind, not one hoof will be left behind as regards my life. I will be fully converted to Jesus Christ when I'm baptized into Him. And all that matters for me to be a servant of His is faithful that He's pleased with. If a child of God, you let things slip, you've allowed some sins in your life, then we beg of you in the light of this and all the rest of the teaching of the Bible, since most of the New Testament is written to Christians to keep them faithful. To seriously think, think about those things and examine your life. If there's an area in your life that you need to repent of because you've gone into sin, then we humbly beg you by the mercies of Christ to repent of those things, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. We'll all help you every way we know how, but some things come right down finally to where when obedience is done, it must be the individual with the love of God and faith in God according to His Word that wills to comply with the Lord's will and obedience to the truth. If you're subject to the blessed gospel invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.